Hello, this is David Harper of Bionic Turtle and a review of liquidity adjusted value at risk. And for FRM candidates, this is based on Jory and Ann Christopher Culp. In order to demonstrate liquidity adjusted value at risk, I'd like to build up to it by looking first at relative VAR and then absolute VAR. We'll see that relative VAR is a special case of absolute VAR and that we only need to do one thing to convert absolute VAR into liquidity adjusted VAR. As usual, I need some assumptions. I only need four to start and that are, these are the following. The wealth of the stock or the portfolio denoted by W. So I'm following Jorian's notation there. And I'll assume the portfolio has a value, an initial value of one million. And then volatility denoted by sigma because it's a standard deviation of 30%. Expected return, typically denoted by Greek mu, I'll assume 10%. And a confidence level, which I select, of 95%. Other popular choices are 99% or greater. And now to get the relative value at risk, or relative VAR, it's very straightforward. In percentage terms, I like to call it the scaled volatility, because all we're doing is multiplying the volatility, that's our sigma, of 30% times the critical Z or normal deviate. Here's the formula. VAR, given some significance or confidence level, is equal to the value of the portfolio multiplied by the normal deviate multiplied by the volatility. All this does right here is multiply on the volatility and scale the volatility as a function of our confidence. The more confident we want to be, the more we have to multiply the volatility. My normal deviate is right here, 1.64, because in Excel, it's equals norm S inv, given a probability of 95%, it returns 1.64. This is a classic one-tailed test in statistics, telling me that for a standard normal distribution, I can be 95% confident the random variable won't exceed more than 1.64. By the way, I'm using the normal distribution here, and the normal and value at risk have received a lot of criticism lately in the context of the subprime problem, but we don't need to use the normal distribution. This is a parametric VAR. It can take any number of distributions as assumptions. That said, we've computed the relative VAR in percentage terms and then in dollar terms simply multiplies the wealth of the portfolio into the equation. So we have the three components here wealth of the portfolio, volatility, and then the volatility multiplied by or scaled by our critical Z or normal deviate. And we get about half a million on a $1 million portfolio. Now the absolute VAR builds on that by including the expected return because so far we haven't included the expected return. And that's because this relative VAR here we typically use for short periods like daily VAR, where implicitly we are assume, assuming the expected return is zero. For longer periods, we should incorporate the expected return and use the absolute value at risk. So here's the formula for that. And notice the only difference here is we are incorporating the expected return negative mu plus the same thing we had before normal deviate times the sigma or volatility scaled. It's negative because it's an offset. This po positive expected return works to our benefit, so it's going to mitigate or offset the loss. And we can see here's the formula in dollar terms, negative mu plus sigma times my critical Z or normal deviate multiplied by the portfolio wealth. And in this case, because my expected return is 10% on a wealth of 1 million, that's 100,000, my absolute VAR here is exactly 100,000 less than my relative VAR. Because my relative VAR was my loss relative to the portfolio value, but my absolute VAR is my loss relative to zero because at the end of the period, I expect this portfolio to grow by 100,000. And so that is positive that offsets. My loss relative to zero is really only 400,000 given these assumptions. So that's my absolute VAR. And now we can look at the liquidity adjusted VAR, which wants somehow 
to incorporate the liquidity, let's say, of the instrument. If it's the, it could be of the portfolio as well. One way to do this, per the suggestion by Jorian, is to use the spread on the instrument. And the spread is the difference between the bid and the ask price divided by the average. So, and, and the theory is that the greater the spread, the less the liquidity in the instrument. So let's assume my spread is 1%. Or more specifically, my spread could be volatile itself. So the mean of my spread is 1%, but my spread itself has a standard deviation of, say, 0.8%. Now, my liquidity adjusted VAR, so I'll pull that formula up right here. The simple way to do it is to just use the mean spread here, and notice the only difference is, same formula as before, here's that absolute VAR, but we're adding one half the spread. So we're increasing the value at risk as a function of the spread, because the higher the spread, the less liquid the instrument, and the greater we want our value at risk to be. Why is it one half the spread instead of the spread? Because the full spread measures the cost of supplying immediacy for a round trip. That's to buy and then sell or to sell and then buy the asset. This is only for the sale of the asset, so we only want one half. We only want, uh, we don't want a round trip. We only want a one way trip. Okay, so now I'm going to come right down here and Take this out. Before I do anything else, I've got here the regular absolute value at risk that we looked at before. Negative the expected return plus sigma times the normal deviate. And all I need to do is add one half the spread. And then that increases my absolute VAR by one half the spread. And so the other thing we can do is if the spread itself is volatile, we can incorporate that uncertainty by using the VAR concept itself. So here's the full formula. It's not nearly as bad as it looks. We've still got the absolute VAR right here, and now we're increasing the VAR by the liquidity, and we're using one half, but not of the spread, but rather the spread plus the normal deviate times the volatility of the spread. And so this gives us the worst expected spread, which, let me move this right up here, is right here. It's 2.32 because it's our 1% mean spread plus the standard deviation of our spread, 0.8, multiplied by the normal deviate. And so what we get here is 2.32 is the worst expected spread with 95% confidence. See the difference? In the basic approach or static approach, we use one half the mean spread. In a more dynamic approach, we use one half the worst expected spread based on some confidence level. And so that here, what I call the volatile spread, if I just move this over and pull this out, I've implemented that formula, this formula right here. And we've got the absolute VAR right here, negative expected return plus volatility times normal deviate. And then we add one half. The, this quantity right here, which is the spread, the mean spread, plus the standard deviation of the spread scaled by the critical Z. So what we've got right here is the worst expected spread. So we're adding one half the worst expected spread. And that gets us the liquidity adjusted value at risk and incorporates the volatility of the spread. So I hope that was helpful. This is David Harper, The Bionic Turtle. Thanks for your time.